We start by returning to our inspirational example with cosine. Let me just recall the basic situation. So the blue curve, that's the cosine function. The red curve, that's the diagonal. We are looking for the intersection. That's the solution of our equation, but also the fixed point location. And we can try the fixed point iteration. And this is the run that I did by hand when I was pretending to be a calculator. But of course, the procedure can do it too. Uh, here, I decided to start at 0. But the next x1 is already 1, and that's what I did by hand over here. And we can see the oscillating values of x. They are jumping around. Eventually, we get some approximation of the fixed point. Now, just for comparison, let's try to rewrite this as a uh, root question. I will talk about it later, and apply the Newton method to it. And we get the answer in just four iterations. Now, we are not really surprised, because when we were estimating in the proof of the Banach's fixed point theorem, estimating the relationship of errors, we actually saw that the fixed point method, the iteration, is a method of order one. So this weak performance is actually fairly uh, expected. But can we do better? Can we somehow tweak this iteration to provide us with a faster convergence? Here we go. Inspiration. We are trying to solve this equation using the fixed point approach, and we prefer flat functions. And actually, it turns out that when the function is flatter, then it's contracting more. It follows from this mean value theorem. When the derivative is small, then also the ratio that we are investigating is very, very small. So we want really, really flat functions. How do we achieve it when we are given such an equation? Well, we can, for instance, multiply it by a very small number. So I'm multiplying by a number, which is presumably small, but we will see later it will not be the case. It's definitely not zero. It's never a good idea multiplying equation by zero. So after I do that, I get a new equation. And now the function on the left, if lambda is small, has also a smaller derivative, which is what I'm aiming for. The problem is that the solution of this equation is no longer a fixed point of my function on the left, because there is this lambda interfering. So I need to do something to recover x on the right. Of course, I could cancel lambda, but that would make the whole business pointless. So instead, I'm going to add a part which is missing here, in a way. So I'm adding 1 minus lambda times x. And when I do, on the left, lambda phi x plus 1 minus lambda x is equal to... And when I put 1 minus lambda x, multiply out, lambda x cancels, and I get just x. So the original equation is equivalent to this equation, where on the left I have a new function, and I can look for its fixed point, applying iteration, and so on. I'm back in business with a new function, phi lambda x. Let me emphasize the formula for phi lambda. So it's based on phi, and then there is an extra part. Notice that these two coefficients they are actually adding up to 1, so this is a weighted average of two functions. One of them is the original function, and the other one is the diagonal function. How does the iteration look like? From this, we get xk plus 1 is equal to lambda phi xk plus 1 minus lambda times xk. And again, I can view this as an average of two sequences now. There are two sequences being connected together using weighted average. Now, the first sequence, phi xk, with a bit of luck, will be convergent, and then it goes to the fixed point. So this part of my formula is taking care of the business that the outcome will be what I want it to be. The second part, xk is actually a sequence which is definitely converging to itself. I'm just take, turning xk plus 1 into xk. Notice that if lambda is 0, then I get 1 here, and xk plus 1 is equal to xk. That's a perfect, con perfectly convergent sequence, because it's a constant sequence. So this is a part which takes care of convergence. And now, this lambda allows me to distribute my faith, in a way. If I like the original convergence, which I get from the original fixed point situation, then I can actually even make lambda larger than 1, 
and then this becomes negative, and this is not a problem, to strengthen the convergence which I already have. On the other hand, if I try iteration with this phi, and I don't quite like it because the convergence is bad, it's slow, or perhaps there is even some divergence, then I can put less weight over here, and I put more weight to this factor which strengthens the convergence tendency. So I choose my lambda basically based on the fact how far I trust my phi. There is another interesting point of view. This can be also seen as a compromise between two graphs. I can look at it not as functions, but as graphs of function graphically. So this new function has a graph, which is an average or compromise between the graph of phi and the graph of x, the diagonal. And I'm trying to pick lambda in such a way that this resulting graph is as flat as possible. That's also another interesting viewpoint. Let's have a look at some pictures. Now, this picture, shows the graph of cosine in dark blue. That's the one which starts on the top and goes down. And it's, uh, it's uh, not too steep. It's flat enough to give us convergence. We saw it in this example. The fixed point iteration converged for the function cosine. But it, it's not exactly flat. And then there is the red curve. That's the diagonal. And the four curves between them, these are actually weighted averages for different lambdas. The green curve, that's when lambda is 0.8. 0.8 means that I put a lot of faith into my function and just 0.2 faith into this stabilizing, stabilizing or converging factor. So the resulting graph is closer to cosine than to the diagonal. It makes sense. And then I start decreasing my lambda to 0.6, 0.4, 0.2. And the graph is changing. It's getting closer and closer to the diagonal graph. There must be some value for of lambda, based on the picture, it seems, where the graph is almost flat in the neighborhood of the fixed point. And if the graph is almost flat, then it means that iteration will work really well. It should be really, really fast. Now, just, you know, just by looking at this picture, I think that the orange curve, which is not easy to see when I'm projecting it, okay, it's one to the third curve from the top, when I'm counting on the left. Okay? or the third curve from the bottom when I'm counting it on the right. So that's a curve which seems to be almost horizontal when it passes the fixed point, and this orange curve corresponds to lambda equal to 0.6. So let's keep this in mind. 0.6 seems to be a value for lambda that makes the graph of the resulting function, of this combined function, sort of flattish around the fixed point. Now, let's have a look at the code here. Here, lambda is equal to 1. When lambda is equal to 1, it means I'm putting all weight on phi, and actually 0 here, I'm not relaxing at all. So when I try relaxation, because this is what is called relaxation, I should have told you that. I'll return to it. So when I try it with lambda equal to 1, I'm actually just doing the fixed point approach. I'm just using the original phi. Now, here in this code, I'm actually allowed to specify the iterating function. And what you can see here, that's exactly the combination that we have here. Lambda times phi and 1 minus lambda times x. That's what we can see over here. So, because lambda is equal to 1, this should yield exactly the same run as before, which took 18 iterations, 18 iterations to actually get us to the answer. So, let's have a look at it. Here we go. 18 iterations, that's exactly the same run. Now, let's decrease lambda to 0.8, which is one of the curves that we saw above. And suddenly, we are just down to seven iterations because we made the graph flatter. What happens if I put it down to 0.6? And we are at four. How fast was Newton? Let's go back. Newton also needed four iterations. So by making our function flatter, we actually achieved the performance of the Newton method, which is wonderful. Notice that for this iteration, we do not need any derivative, which brings us to another topic. This is an interesting alternative because we do not have to differentiate to do the iteration. We are just substituting it to the function. Okay, let's try to move still closer to zero. So we are strengthening convergence. And things are getting worse again. So it seems that between 0.4 and 0.8, there lies some optimum, optimal value for lambda, which makes convergence really fastest. How about 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 
0.6. So 0.6, if I just want to play with one decimal digit, 0.6 seems to be the best. Uh, I don't feel like testing 0 0.62, 0 0.64, and so on. This is already wonderful. This is the performance of Newton method, of method of order two. So this whole business is called relaxation, and this lambda is called relaxation factor. So what this proves is that sometimes it's good to relax. And this is a very important advice for life. Don't stress yourself out. Sometimes you just relax, and things will go really well. Uh, I think I put a slide here. Yeah, because this is really important. So, relaxation. Relaxation for a fixed point iteration means that you simply use the formula with some lambda which you choose and you get the outcome. And before we move on, let's go back to my example. Okay, so I tried relaxation, I tried iteration without any relaxation, and in 18 iterations I got my answer. And then I did some experiments with lambda. Good question. Why did I do those experiments if I already had my answer? So I was actually just wasting time. Well, okay, I was illustrating the relaxation point, but let's have a look at it as a problem from real life. Somebody gives you a problem to solve, you apply iteration, you get the answer. Okay, it took, it took a while, but yeah, you have the answer. So why would you try it again and again and again? Well, uh, two reasons. First, one of them. Sometimes it happens that they are solving problems that are very similar. They are of similar nature and there are just some little details tweaked. So you solve it once and then you solve it again with little modification, again with a little modification. And in such a case, it makes sense to assume that essentially because these problems are very similar, that they have similar properties. In particular, if you identify some relaxing factor which works really well for this type of a problem, it will also work for a similar problem and so on. So Every time you are doing one run of this problem, of one, uh, let's say, variation of uh, mutation of this problem, you try different lambda. Once you try with lambda equal to one, without relaxation at all, and you see how long it takes. And the next time they bring you this problem, but with tiny change, you try lambda equal to 0.8. And you see, okay, is it better or not? And the next time, and so on. So after you solve this problem about five times in different slight variations, you may end up with actually being able to solve it ten times faster. So this definitely pays. So that's one aspect. Uh, the second aspect is that sometimes you can actually determine better lambda using uh, analytic tools. So let's have a look at it. Here's our situation. We have a function on a neighborhood of a fixed point, and typically we can actually narrow down the fixed point using, let's say, something like a bisection method. Notice that we are comparing two expressions. So we can start substituting different axes and compare these two numbers. Which one of them is higher, which one of them is lower? And if you get to the situation where x is higher and phi x lower, and then here it's the other way around, then for a continuous function, these two curves must cross somewhere. And therefore, when you exchange positions like that, you are pretty sure that your fixed point is somewhere in the middle. It's bracketing again. Bracketing just applied in a different setting. So you can actually narrow down your fixed point in this way by experimenting. And then also it allows you to choose your x naught reasonably close. Now, if you get lucky, you can identify some interval which is sent to itself, and you can apply the Banach fixed point theorem, but typically this is difficult. So what do you do instead? You're looking at the derivative of your function, and you're asking, is it small here? Well, being small here locally does not guarantee anything, but it's a good hint. And if you find that the derivative is small, you try iteration, and you say, okay, I have a good chance that it will work. If the iteration doesn't work, or if you simply don't like the derivative because it's too large, you may start thinking of using relaxation. So you are using function phi lambda x is equal to lambda phi x plus one minus lambda x. Now, what is your requirement? Your requirement is that this function is as flat as possible. Well, the flattest function is the function which has derivative equal to zero. But the key question is where? And essentially you want this derivative to be equal to zero at the fixed point, but you don't know that. So close to fixed point, which you also often don't know quite 
precisely, but you know when you are, when you are doing those, those iterations. You start somewhere, so at least you can ask for the uh, iterating function to be flat where you start. That's a good beginning, so let's put x naught here. That's a good requirement. Let's substitute into the formula. So I want a derivative of this, which means I have to differentiate here, and I get lambda phi derivative at x plus 1 minus lambda times derivative of this, which is 1, this is supposed to be 0. And this is supposed to be 0 when I substitute x naught into it. And that's an equation where phi derivative x naught is something which presumably I know because I know the function phi. And if it's differentiable, this is OK. And I can solve this for lambda. Uh, let me see, how do I want to play it? Uh, I think I will mul multiply out and I will keep 1 on the left and everything else will go to the right. So there will be lambda here minus lambda phi prime x naught. And this allows me to deduce formula. Lambda, which is optimal, but optimal around x naught. This is important to remember. This is local optimization. Optimal lambda is 1 over 1 minus phi derivative x naught. Therefore, you can actually, ahead of your experiments, already figure out a good lambda. Let's have a look at our cosine example. So we have an equation, cosine x is equal to x. Let's have a look at the relaxed iteration. It uses the formula phi lambda x is equal to lambda cosine x plus 1 minus lambda x. So the formula for iteration goes like that. xk plus 1 is lambda cosine xk plus 1 minus lambda xk. And if I know lambda, I can even do it by hand if, well, perhaps not this one because of the cosine. But sometimes you can do iteration like that by hand. Now I'm asking, what is the best optimal lambda? Well, lambda optimal is 1 divided by 1 minus, and let's see, what's the derivative of cosine? It's minus sine. So it's plus sine of x naught. That's the optimal lambda around x naught. Now, what is our x naught? Well, originally I was using 1 when I was, when I was doing the run by hand, but now for the procedure I used initial value 0, and you can actually see why. Because uh, I can substitute 0 into sine. So 4 x naught is equal to 0, lambda optimal is sine of 0 is 0, it's 1. Well, this does not look exactly like optimal lambda for me, because we got a totally different result when we tried experimenting. Well, the reason is that this lambda is optimal only around zero, but our iteration moves elsewhere really quickly. From zero, we move to something like 0.7. So let's say that you do one or two steps of iteration. This looks like a good idea. You try a few first steps, and optimistically you feel that after, let's say, x2 stage, you are closer to the fixed point, and perhaps now you can finally determine your lambda. So, for x0 being, well, let's say 0.7, okay? 0.7 seems like a good guess after the first few iterations. How much is lambda optimal? Well, I don't know how much is sine of 0.7, okay? I mean, this is understandable. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to get, uh, get some room here. Let's see. And I am going to calculate how much is, so I want to evaluate, I want uh, the answer not as an algebraic formula, but as a decimal number. I'm asking for one divided by one plus sine of 0.7. Now, did I type it right? Yes. And the answer is it's about 0.61. So, let's go back to my run over here. I tried 0.6 and I got four iterations. I try 0.61 and I get four iterations. Uh, and this is the picture, by the way. The blue curve is the cosine function and the green curve is the curve, is the graph of this function with lambda equal 0.61, it really seems flat around the fixed point. Okay, so it all fits together. Okay, uh, if I wanted to play really hard, 
I would look at the estimate of the root, which is 0 0.739, and I try to put it here, 0 0.739, and I get, again, something like 0 0.6. So you can see that we are close to the optimal lambda, and it actually works for even for 0.7. Mm, it's not bad. It's not bad. So the moral of the story is that information, unless you are using the Banach fixed point theorem when you have those intervals and things like that, you play it locally, and you have to be careful about it. You have to be careful about the fact that your iteration may move to another place, and perhaps you should analyze it again. But you can actually use analysis sometimes to optimize your lambda, and then you get really fast runs. If your function is so com uh, complicated that you cannot figure it out analytically, or if your function does not have a derivative, for instance, because you are not given a formula but values, then you can try uh, to find lambda by repeated runs experimentally, as I've been talking about it. Now, let's have a look at something. You start with x0, you get x1, and you determine optimal lambda for it. You do iteration, with this lambda 1, you get x2, and you determine optimal lambda 2, and so on. So you get lambda k for xk at each stage. So if this calculation is not too crazy, if, if it's just a simple formula, you can actually afford to incorporate it into your fixed point iteration, and you can update lambda, the optimal lambda, at each stage, and this should be super fast. Now, to see why is this interesting, uh, let's erase this and let's have a look at it again from a different point of view. Here is the situation. You are trying to solve an algebraic equation, and they actually prepared it for you so that you can apply the root-finding methods. Newton method, Seekan method, bisection, and so on. But for some reason, you do not feel like this, so you would like to use the fixed-point approach using the fixed-point iteration. Now, an equation is just some algebraic expressions, and you can rearrange it in many ways so that x appears isolated on one side. However, if you want to develop some theory, we have to settle on some standard procedure and work with that. And it's traditional to get the right type of equation in the easiest possible way, simply by getting plus x on each side. So on the left, we have fx plus x, and on the right, we have x. And this is our phi. So that, that's the standard transformation of a root problem into a fixed point problem. And this standard transformation has the advantage that we can do it always, and this advantage that it almost never works. Uh, but it's another story. We will get to it. By the way, some authors, before they add x to each side, they multiply this whole equation by minus. So here on the left, they have x minus fx as an alternative phi. Uh, which one is better? The answer is none of them. For different functions, this works better or the other works better. Uh, yeah, it's a toss-up, essentially. So I like the simplicity. I keep it like that. Some authors, they use x minus fx because it has some minor advantages at some moments. OK, let's, keep with, uh, let's stick with this one. So I have my root problem. I transformed it into a fixed point problem, and now I want to apply relaxation. So what is the relaxation formula? I have to take my original fixed point function and multiply it by lambda. And then I add 1 minus lambda times x. I multiply out, and I get lambda fx, plus lambda x minus lambda x, so that's it, it becomes very nice. So this general theory that we are trying to develop here leads us to this nice formula. So that's the relaxed iterating function if we start with the root-finding problem. There is an interesting alternative way to get to the same place. Here is my motivation. I want to introduce factor lambda. So I take this original equation, and I just multiply it by lambda, and I get lambda fx is equal to 0, and then I add x. And I get lambda fx plus x is equal to x, and this is my phi lambda.
Okay? So it's just an aside that you can get to the same place in two different ways. Now, let's assume that we did some iterations and we have already point xk and we decide to optimize our relaxation. So what would be the optimal factor lambda for xk? Well, we have a formula somewhere here. I preserved it. So we are getting 1 over 1 minus, and now we should take derivative of pi and substitute xk after we are done with this derivative. I hope you know the notation. This is delayed substitution. OK, how much is it? 1 over 1 minus, and I differentiate, and I get f derivative xk, and here derivative of x is 1. And this is in brackets, like that. So I just differentiate it, and I substitute it xk. And now I look at it, and I say, wait a second. Uh, one cancels, and I'm going to think minus 1 over f prime xk. That's the optimal lambda if I decide to follow the standard transformation from a root problem to fixed point problem. Now I'm applying iteration, fixed point iteration, with optimized lambda, which corresponds to xk. So I'm optimizing at every stage. How does it work? xk plus 1 is phi lambda k xk. I'm using the relaxed formula with optimized lambda. So I should take the optimal lambda, which is negative 1 over f prime xk, multiply it by fxk and add xk. And when I look at it again, I see that I'm taking xk and subtracting fxk over f prime xk. And this is the Newton method. So the Newton method is in fact something like a fixed point, standard fixed point approach, which was optimized at every stage. Which is another explanation why it is so fast, because it's optimized locally. That's a very interesting coincidence. Two different viewpoints, and we end up with the same idea for a very super fast method. However, before we start praising it too much, notice that I said this is for the standard transformation. We add x and so on. There may be other transformations, and they may actually beat the Newton speed even without any relaxation. It all depends how you create this function phi. So again, this fixed point approach is interesting because you don't go by numbers. You don't have a strict way which you follow and you get it. You have to think, you have to experiment, you have to look at what you are doing. Uh, this is very nice. So we covered now all the theory, all the interesting aspects, and it's time to do some experimentation. In this chapter, whenever we introduce some new method, we always use this cubic equation to test it. And we will continue in this tradition. Let's first narrow down or bracket the point that we're looking for. So, this is the root point of u, and I can try to substitute in some numbers into f. If I substitute 1, I get negative 8, which is negative. And if I substitute, uh, let's say, 3, I expect this to be positive because the cubic power is really, really fast. So, 3 cubed is 27, plus 3 is 30, which is a nice number, minus 10 is 20, which is also a nice number, and it's positive. Okay, so now we know that the number that we're looking for is in the range between 1 and 3. So x, uh, it will be the fixed point later on, is in the interval 1 and 3. By the way, the solution is actually 2. We know it, but we will pretend that we do not know it. But it will give us something to look forward to. And for the starting iteration point, we can take 1, because it's reasonably close to the root, which is somewhere here in between. Okay, So that's the situation. Also, let me recall, the formula for the relaxed iteration looks like this. And the formula for the optimal lambda is 1 over 1 minus uh, f prime x naught. That's it. So that's the playground for essentially the remaining part of this lecture. 
let's play with the fixed point approach. As the first attempt, we will try the standard approach. So, I take this equation and I add x to each side. And I get x cubed plus 2x minus 10 is equal to x. So this is standard. And let's see how it works. So what we have over here is our iterative function phi, x cubed plus 2x minus 10. And let's see what we think about our chances for convergence. Now, ideally, we would test the Banach's fixed point theorem. And for that, we would have to identify some interval which is transformed into the same interval using this cubic polynomial. Now, this is not really easy to find, if it exists at all. So we will skip this, unfortunately, but this is typical. And instead, we will just uh, get some advice on the flatness. So what do we know about the derivative? Derivative is 3x squared plus 2, and this is definitely at least 2 on this range that we are interested in. So this is bad. It means that the derivative is significantly larger than 1. Significantly. It's even more than 2, so it's not even close. So I'm, I'm pessimistic. I don't think this will work. So here we go. Here is my function. And just to get some comparison, the Newton method can find the root in five iterations, which is perhaps also an interesting information. So Newton, five iterations. Now, if I try the standard iteration, fixed point theorem iteration, I can actually just call on my procedure. And uh, after three iterations, that was really quick, after three iterations, the procedure refused to work anymore because it says the numbers in iteration are too large. That's another check. Uh, there are ex essentially two checks. I've been talking about one of them. If there are too many iterations, the default says 50, but I can extend it. If there are too many iterations, the procedure stops and says, hey, look at it, there may be some trouble. Another check is about numbers. If they grow larger than a million, and you can also change it in this procedure, if they are too large, the procedure stops because, yeah, you deserve to be warned about it. This looks really, really bad. Bad divergence. So, this is what I've been talking about. I've been hinting that the standard approach, the standard transformation from a root problem to a fixed point problem, is usually, usually, typically, not exactly the best one. Can we improve it by relaxation? Well, we can try two things. We can try experimenting, or we can try to find the optimal lambda. Let's try the optimal lambda way based on our initial value 1. So we should take 1 over 1 minus. Now we should differentiate the uh, function. And we have the derivative here, which is nice. 3x squared plus 2. And we substitute x equal to 1. One is the starting point. So it seems that the optimal lambda around 1, OK, 3 plus 1 is 5, negative 4. It's negative 1 over 4. This seems to be the optimal lambda. OK, uh, first, the standard transformation. That's my phi. And I'm just checking that the general procedure did it right. So if I choose my transformation by adding x to the left-hand side, which is the code over here, and then I use it, and I can actually specify my own phi in this procedure, which is what I did, I get the same run, that's correct. And I will try uh, lambda equal to 1, which means I'm not doing any relaxation, and I should obtain the same run. Exactly. And now let's play. Let's decrease lambda to, let's say, 0.5. Will it help? And the answer is it helped a little bit, because it took one iteration more before the procedure gave up. So, yeah, it did help. How about 0.2? We are going in the right direction, it seems. Uh, one more iteration, OK, but still nothing great, 0.1. Now, it doesn't really make much sense to go really close to 0, because then we are losing the connection with the iteration itself. If we put 0 weight here, we don't know where the iteration should go. So. In desperation, let's try negative number. Well, it's recommending negative 1 over 4, negative 0.25, and let's see. Well, we still ran out of uh, room, but this time we didn't stop because of uh, huge numbers, but because we reached the maximum allowed number of iterations. Let's have a look at the axis. 
Wow, we've got a cycle. This sometimes happens. Remember the picture when we are jumping from the function to the diagonal and back to the function and so on, doing all kinds of nice journeys? Sometimes it happens that you are just going in circles. So for lambda equal to negative 1 over 4, we are going in circles, which is not good. But we are not going to infinity, which is a good sign. Uh, I've been talking about it. This negative 1 quarter is optimal around 1, but obviously we are moving elsewhere. So yeah, let's, let's try to play with it a little bit. Uh, OK, how about negative 0.2? Well, this is better. We'll, uh, do we still have a cycle? Well, every fourth number starts with 0 point, 0 point 0.5162. Yeah, we have a cycle, but this time the cycle is longer. And it's not quite true, actually. There are subtle changes. So we are like not going in a circle, but it's a circle which is slowly moving, slowly moving. So it's a little bit better, but still not all that great. OK. How about negative 0.1? Wow, we've got convergence, seven. Seven, this is definitely nice. And it took us to two, which is also great. And seven iteration is not all that bad compared to Newton. Now, of course, we know that the optimal lambda is best determined at the uh, fixed point. And normally, you don't know it, but let's cheat. We know the fixed point. So lambda optimal for x equal to two will be 1 over 1 minus, I'm substituting 2 into this derivative. Uh, 4, 12, 14, uh, this is negative 1 over 13, which is great. I love 13. You know this probably already. So I really love this optimal lambda. And let's try to put it over here into my procedure. So negative uh, 1 over 13. And we get to 5 iterations, which is matching the performance of the Newton method. So not only that we saved divergence by smart relaxation, but we actually turned the convergence into a really quick convergence, which is matching the Newton performance. And it doesn't get any better, really. If you try experimenting with the numbers, yeah, this is the best. But of course, we cheated because we knew the root. So if you didn't know the root, we would have to, let's say, try a few iterations. We see how it goes. We try to optimize by experimentation. This could be saved. But it's not the best approach, actually. We saw that when we tried without relaxation, we got the divergence. Let me put it here. So the standard approach, eventually, we forced it to work. We got convergence, but it took a while. Let me show the picture for this. OK, what do we see here? The red curve, that's the diagonal. And the blue curve, that's our function phi, which we are trying to use for fixed point. So this phi, it's a cubic curve, which is growing quite fast. It seems around 2, which is the fixed point. And that's why we got this divergence. Uh, it's really steep. It's not flat by any means. Now, if I use relaxation, I am sort of like doing average between the red and the blue curve. The diagonal, our function, phi diagonal, y is equal to x. When we are using lambdas from the range between 0 and 1, it means we are taking compromises. We are taking curves from this area. And if we do it here, if we apply such lambdas here, we still get something which is very steep. So green curves, which are here in this area, are no good. We have to move outside, which means that we have to either make lambda larger than 1 to get closer to phi, but from the other side of this shape, or we have to take negative lambdas, which take us somewhere here. So we took negative lambda, and we got outside of this natural range to a flat curve. Okay, so this explains that sometimes lambdas, which are non-traditional, which means negative or larger than 1, can actually make sense. All depends on the situation. OK, uh, the standard approach eventually worked out, but not anything great. Let's try something else. We have an equation here, and our aim is to isolate x on one side. So why don't we just leave it here and move everything else to the other side? So we will get 10 minus x cubed is x. That's our attempt number two, using algebra with this iterating function. So the iterating formula would be xk plus 1 is 10 minus xk cubed. 
That's a very nice iterating formula. Does it stand any chance of convergence? Well, as an experienced, uh, let's say, fixed point iterator, uh, I'm mildly pessimistic because this cubic power uh, does not seem very friendly given that I'm working with large numbers. If it was close to zero, then x cube is flat, we know that. But when you are to the right from one, x cube is really steep. So I'm not very happy about it. I take the derivative in absolute value. I have to be careful. I'm taking it in absolute value. I didn't have to worry here, but I do have to worry here. So it's uh, just 3x squared. That's the derivative in absolute value. And this is at least 3, which is more than 1, on interval 1, 3. So again, uh, I don't see it very optimistically. Uh, here we go. Here is my phi. But now, this time, my phi will be different, 10 minus x cubed. So I'm really doing custom things. This is my new iterating function, and I use it without any relaxation, and I go divergence. This is what I expected. So this phi leads to divergence. And it's, it seems equally bad as the standard way. Now, can we fix it by uh, relaxation? So again, let's go by experimenting. If I try 0.5, uh, still bad. How about negative 0.5? Still bad. How about 1.5? Still bad. This looks really bad. Uh, does it mean that it's hopeful? That's a good question. Uh, perhaps I should try some other lambdas. Perhaps I've been too hasty. 0.8. Still bad. 0.2. Oh, it actually looks quite hopeful. Well, we seem to be cycling again, so let's move around 0.2. How about 0.25? Uh, wow, we've got a nice cycle. How about 0.15? Uh, another cycle, 0.1. Ah, I got convergence. So this is also, this can be saved. It's salvageable using relaxation. So for relaxation, Let's have a look at the optimal lambda. It's 1 over 1 minus, and here I have to put the derivative, but without absolute value. So I take the derivative here, and I get minus 3x squared, and I substitute some point into it. So let's say that I try it around 1, which is where I'm starting. Then lambda optimal should be, OK, I'm substituting 1 here. This is 1 over 4. And 1 over 4, I tried it and it didn't work, because this is optimized in a different place. Uh, so let's have a look at optimization, which is at the uh, actual fixed point. And there, lambda optimal is, well, let's see. I'm adding 3x squared, uh, 4, 12, 13, 1 over 13. Uh, no, yes. I can't believe it. 1 over 13 again. So let's try this. This is an optimal lambda, 1 over 13. And we again match to the performance of Newton. But again, this we would know in actual real life. But by experimentation, we could perhaps save this at least. OK, let's have a look at the picture. So this time, we are in a similar situation, but there is a difference. This time, the blue curve is actually it's a decreasing function. Here, the function was increasing, and here, the function was decreasing. So we took very, very tiny lambda, and uh, yeah, things worked out. Things worked out reasonably well. OK, let's have a look at another transformation. Where is it? My phi. So now we will try something else, because this also was not all that great. OK. I look at this equation and I ask myself, is there some other way to isolate x? Well, I took it from here. What if I take it from here? So x will be, I take these two guys and I move them to the right, 10 minus x, and then I take the cubic root. So that's my new phi. Now, taking cubic root, is not a bad idea because the cubic root is flat for larger numbers. So this looks hopeful, actually. 
let me just try down the iteration again. That's the standard iteration for this function. 10 minus xk to 1 over 3. Uh, let's have a look at our expectations. f prime x in absolute value. So I'm taking derivative, so one third drops down, and then there will be 10 minus x to negative two thirds, so it will be like that. 10 minus x to two thirds. How much is it? Well, that's a good question. Uh, x ranges between roughly one and three. Perhaps we may run out of this interval in our experiments, but what is the largest possible value? This is indeed denominator, so I'm asking for the smallest possible value. Uh, well, the smallest possible value for this is when x is equal to 3, and then there is something like 7 to 2 over 3. This is a large number. This is a very small number, very tiny number. Uh, I don't want to calculate, okay, 7 squared is 49, which is about 50. Cubic root of 50 is something like 3 and something. 3, 3, I would say roughly with quotation mark, okay, I'm just guessing. This should be less than 1 over 10, which is definitely much smaller than 1. So I'm very, very optimistic. This should work right out of the, out of the box. So uh, I have to be careful in Maple because Maple has some strange idea about taking cubic powers. So I have to do it like that. And it's the cubic root from 10 minus x. Here we go. Now, that was wicked. Four iterations led me to the answer. Converges in four iterations. Notice that this is better than Newton, even without relaxation. So what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is that relaxation is powerful. It can fix your iteration. But this iteration is based on a transformation, which was your choice. So relaxation can work only with something that you provide, that you start with. And it's your choice where you start. If you start wisely, then the relaxation has a much better starting point and you don't even sometimes need it. Sometimes the iteration actually is so good that relaxation cannot even improve it. And I strongly suspect this is the case. But let's do some experimenting. So this shows that rather than working with relaxation and spending a lot of time on it, if it looks like that, it may be much smarter to actually simply try a different transformation of your original equation. If you don't like your transformation because the function is too steep, you simply try another formula, another rearrangement, which leads to a flat function, and you are happy. Okay, let's, uh, let's just experiment a little bit. Uh, this is really, really quickly convergent, so I can even strengthen it. Let me put 1.1, which says I want more of this, not less. Uh, no, it doesn't work. How about 0.9? Uh, we've got down to three iterations. Now, this is almost half of the Newton performance. This is amazing. How about 0.8? Uh, it's already too much again. So it seems 0.9 is about the optimum. Lambda optimal, when x is near 2, should be about 1 over 1 minus. Now we have to put the derivative in here, and I want to substitute 2 into it. So it's 1 third, 1 over 10 minus 2 to power 2 thirds. And I actually have to be careful, because this is the derivative in absolute value. That's why I didn't have to worry about signs. But now I do have to worry because this is the derivative itself over here, without absolute value. So uh, I take derivative. One third comes down, that's OK. The power changes uh, inside function. When I differentiate the inside function, there will be minus jumping out. So there will be minus here. I have to be careful, super careful. 10 minus 2, do I dare? I don't like those powers. Let's see if I'm lucky. 10 minus 2 is 8. Cubic root of 8 is 2. I am lucky. 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12. So it's 1 over 12, which is added to 1. This is 13 over 12. So I'm getting 12 over 13. Now, this is a remarkable coincidence. Another 13 in the game. Uh, yeah, I really like the number. OK, let's close it off. This has been a very successful experiment. Uh, 
12 over 13, this is something smaller than 1, but close to 1. So it seems that our experimental guess, 0.9, let's see over here, was more or less correct. Uh, okay, I don't completely trust myself in this calculation, so let's ask Maple, and let's actually even ask Maple to evaluate the derivative. So lambda optimal should be 1 divided by, and now it comes, 1 minus, and now we want to take, we want to substitute value 2 into derivative of my phi with respect to x. Did I forget something? Let's see. I substitute, I do this, I do that. Of course, I have to end it with semicolon. And Maple actually sometimes refuses to evaluate into decimal form. So I have to force it. Uh, I think that's it. O point something something. So our experimental value 0.9 was most likely quite okay. And now I ask Maple to take this number and multiply it by 13. And if we get 12, then I was correct in my, oh yeah, we are getting 12. So this is optimal is really 12 over 13. In decimal numbers, this is 0.923. Let's try to put here 0.923. Uh, okay, three. We never get better than three, so this is optimal. This is wickedly fast. So this is the winner so far. Even though without relaxation, four iterations, we put it down to three. Wonderful. Again, let's have a look at the picture, but we will see something new. I don't quite expect it. Well, the blue curve, that's this function phi, and you can see that it's already flat. That's why we have this wonderful performance. And by optimizing lambda, we made it slightly flatter, and we saved one iteration. Wonderful. Okay, uh, this is actually a game that I enjoy. You take a formula and you start thinking, okay, where would I get some x's out of it? How can I get x from such an equation? Well, let's have a look at this idea. I can factor out x, and I get x squared plus 1 minus 10 is equal to 0. Now, what can I do with that? I have two sources of x. I could try to pull x from here, which would require me to take square root. Now, square root is flat around between 1 and 3. This doesn't sound like a bad idea, but square root has trouble with existence. If some negative numbers come in, this could be tricky, but it's not a blind alley. Another possibility, another venue here is to isolate this x, and that's what I will do. I will move 10 to the right, I will divide it by this expression, and this will give me x. So that's my phi. And when I'm looking at it, I sort of like the derivative and also like the shape. It's a hill-shaped curve. Um, this looks also hopeful. So what's the derivative of this? Derivative of this, uh, I don't feel like using the quotient rule. So instead, I imagine that it's x squared plus 1 to power negative 1 over here. And when I imagine it like that, there will be negative 10 divided by x squared plus 1 squared. So this took care of the outside derivative, and it's multiplied by 2x. So that's the derivative, and I should ask about the absolute value, and I should ask how large it is. Now let's see, how much is this number around 1? Around 1, this is uh, 4 in the denominator, and 20 in the numerator is 5. So the derivative at 1 is, about fi is 5 in absolute value. That's too much. I don't like it. I don't really like it. Around 3, uh, 3, 9, 10, 100 in the denominator, and 60 on the top. Phi at 3 is, uh, did I say 60? Yeah, 6 over 10, which is 3 over 5. This is less than 1. So around 3, it's flattish. So I'm getting mixed signals. I don't really know. Uh, okay, let's experiment. Why not? So this time I'm taking 10 and dividing it by x squared plus 1. OK, uh, I'm getting uh, a cycle. Is it a perfect cycle? The answer is yes. So it's not a total divergence. It's not a total disaster. But it's not something to write home about either. Uh, but because it's so, let's say, reasonably nice, some relaxation might fix it. How about 0.9? I don't like that. How about some more intensive relaxation, 0.5? Wow. Now, talk about luck. This is the winner. Absolute winner. 
two iterations. What happens if I put six? I still get convergence. So this is a rather aggressive relaxation, 0.5. You know, I don't trust this function all that much when I'm using just half of its weight, 0.4. Decent. This is the Newton performance in five iterations. That's, that's how the Newton did. But with lambda equal 0.5, wow. But we got lucky, of course. Lambda is equal 0.5, two iterations. So by a remarkable piece of luck, this happens to be a winner if we also consider relaxation. Otherwise, out of the box, this guy is the winner. Interesting. Uh, let me see. Picture. So, what you see here is exactly corresponding to uh, this information. Around 1, the function is growing really steeply, that's the blue curve. Around 3, it's uh, a little bit flattish. With the relaxation 0.5, we moved it so that it's relatively flat on the right and around the fixed point, but I do not quite see it as optimal. Perhaps uh, there is even a better way. The fact that we jumped into the solution in two iterations was actually more, to, more due to algebra. We, we got simply lucky that we ended up at 2. If we ended up at 2.2, uh, we would have many more cycles because substantially this iteration is slower. The, function, the green function is not totally flat. So we got really lucky uh, due to algebra, not due to the properties of iteration. Wow, that was really wicked. Okay, uh, how about, how about, how about, um, let's, try the, let's try the version with square root. So, I move 10 to the other side, I divide by x, I subtract 1, and then there will be just x squared left, so to get it I take square root. And this is phi x. Do I like it? The answer is well, well, well. Let me see. If x happens to be larger than 10, then this number will be negative. So this all makes sense for x less than or equal 10. Definitely. Uh, hopefully, I will never get that far. So this looks mildly optimistic. How about the derivative? Well, 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 well. Let's see. I have to take the absolute value eventually. I take the derivative of the square root, which is 2 square roots of 10 over x minus 1, and then I have to take the derivative of the inside function, which is negative 10 over x squared. Now, how much do I like it? That's a good question. Well, what happens when x is 1? When x is 1, this is square root of 9, which is 3, so I'm dividing by 6, 10 divided by 6. This is too much. This is bad. This is more than 1, to be precise. More than 1. That's important. When x is 3, then this is 10 over 3. Ouch! Okay, let's say this is 3. Minus 1 is slightly more than 3. Minus 1 is 2 and something. Square root of 2 and something, it's let's say 1.5 times 2 is 3. I'm dividing by 3. I'm dividing by 9. I'm dividing by 27, 10 over 27, roughly which is small than 1. So again, I'm getting mixed signals. I'm getting mixed signals regarding this iteration. So, uh, well, let's see, where is it? My phi, here. So I'm taking square root of 10 divided by x and subtracting 1. Is that the right formula? 10 over x minus 1, square root of it. Uh, yeah, here we go. And we got convergence, actually, out of the box. But it's convergence, which is essentially uh, rather slow. 18 iterations. So this is roughly linear convergence. And again, we could try to find optimal lambda. Do I feel like playing with this formula? Um, not really, I have to admit. Okay, okay, let's try it by experimentation. So, lambda 0.5, okay, it worked well. Oh, now this is unbelievable. So, we, when we try to relax and use lambda equal 0.5, we get it in two iterations again. Now, I said that this is due to algebra, not, not due to the quality. So, let's try something a little bit nasty. 
instead of starting at 1, I will start at 1.3 or 1.03, okay? Let's just change it a tiny little bit. And then the algebraic luck no longer applies, and we are more looking at the, let's say, qualities of the iteration, and we are to four iterations. So that's really the difference between the quality of your situation and algebraic luck. We just lucked into the number, into the number two as the answer there. This is more realistic appraisal of the qualities. So it seems that these three transformations, they are of about the same quality when it comes to achievable performance. All of them can get you to four iterations, but for these two, you have to use relaxation. This one gives you four iterations right out of the box, and this one actually allows you to improve it when you do relaxation, and this improvement is really based on the quality of the function, not on luck. Wow, I haven't been that lucky in a while. So, uh, yeah, that's the general example. Uh, on a test, you will be given an equation, and I will ask you to show two different ways to transform it into a fixed point problem and analyze what's going to happen. So essentially, I expect something to see something like that. Okay? Uh, you can use the standard transformation if you want. You can use any other transformation that you can think of. You will not be expected to actually provide the calculations and check whether the thing diverges or converges. Rather, I expect you to look at the derivative on the neighborhood where you work, and you will be given the starting point. X0 will be given to you, okay? Just like here, X0 is 1, you will be given the starting point, and you will be expected to look at the derivative, how large it is, and make some conclusion. You have to justify it. You have to tell me it's more than one, it's less than one. You have to tell me how you decide whether the, in, the situation is optimistic or pessimistic. I don't expect you to do, to do the full, uh, let's say, Banach fixed point theorem investigation because I didn't do it here either. I didn't look for interval which is mapped into itself, things like that. Too much work. So I just want you to look at local situation and make appraisal. Tell me, I, I see it optimistically, I see it pessimistically, and also I will ask you to show a few iterations by hand so that you can illustrate that you know what you are doing. So for instance, uh, some nice formula. Which one do I like? Um, perhaps this one is nice. So if you decide to transform the equation into this way to get a fixed point problem, and I tell you that x naught is one, then you could, by hand, substituting into this formula, figure out that x1 is 10 minus 1 cubed, so x1 is 9, and x2 will be 10 minus 9 cubed, uh, which is a lot. So those problems which I'm preparing for you, they will be specially prepared, I have to be careful, so that you can actually do the calculations by hand. Usually I ask for two iterative steps. So here, well, actually you can simply write 10 minus 9 cubed. And I take it. I don't need this in any other calculation. So you can leave it like that. Yeah, that's good. It's a precise answer, although I don't, I don't see it as a number. But yeah, it's a precise answer. Okay? So this is just to let you know what I expect from you. I definitely expect you to be able to do this calculation. And if you want some I mean, full points, then you should also be able to do a little bit about optimization for the relaxation, to be able to set up relaxation, uh, relaxation equations, things like that. Then you get full points. You will be happy. I will be happy. And that's it regarding the chapter called Solving Unsolvable Algebraic Equations. There will be no more tricks, but there will be a bonus video.